Uh, up next, we're gonna have Jay and Chris presenting on focus, putting a lens on what drives audience engagement. And they each are going to do this a little differently. Christoph's gonna share a interesting fun fact about Jay and she's going to do it with Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, let's give him a round of applause, guys. <laughs> Fun fact about Jay, well, he's a movie producer, successful from New York. That's a fun fact. That is a fun fact. But not, not surprise me now. Does anybody know Chris? Yes. Uh, fun fact, but he is an incredible boss. So all this other stuff about the tech stuff, he happens to be an incredible father and partner and family man. And it's, I don't know if that's fun or not, but it's meaningful. <laughs> now you know something about it. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, it does, actually. Hold on. Check, check. Yeah. Uh, we've had great presentations today. So this is hopefully, met, it matches the level of what we've seen today. And I really hope it uh i've known michael for years now i guess feels like it we've grown this partnership together and today me and jay would like to take you on a small journey uh about the meaningful attention in the entertainment industry uh i won't force you to butcher my name so just call me chris uh, polish is not the most uh, easy language i can imagine that uh, Jay is uh, our partner. We are working together on a number of initiatives. Uh, he is expert in entertainment industry, and will really the fire. I am. It's called marketing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll take you on this small journey. Uh, also, excuse my voice. It's this time of the year that really sucks. So yeah, I'm taking a toll on it. Yeah, very sexy. A uh, few disclaimers before we proceed. We are not marketing experts. So some of the information I'm going to share today are biased. It's my perspective, how we see uh, analysis, perception, attention. We'll try to mingle in something from the entertainment business to make it more fun, to make it more appealing to the general population. Um, it's again very personal so anything that we are going to discuss today flows from my own experience how i perceive entertainment perceive attention and perceive the shift from back then to today how we see things in the the multimedia world yeah let's talk about yeah oopsie not this yeah so let's set the scene Back then, when there was no Netflix, when there was no Apple, that's what we did, right? There was this one focal point, one lens for entertainment at home. We all perceived whatever was streamed, streamed that's a nice word today, right? Streamed, was played or aired on TV. There was a commercial, it had our focus, right? Maybe someone went and made some coffee, but in general, we had this attention. This was our focal point. So what's changed in the recent years? <coughs> this happened. Sorry. No, 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 it's a free flow. It's a free flow dis uh, discussion. This happened, right? Netflix, Apple came, and now, yes, we do have a TV. It's a nice 75 inch flat screen that hangs on my wall. I have Netflix, Amazon Prime, I have Apple, but I also have my iPhone. I also, in the post-COVID era, have my laptop typically at home, and I do some very unhealthy work and watching situation, right? So there is no attention that's focused on one thing. Now, we perceive Netflix as a company that is observing what's being streamed. They gather data, which country, which demographic is watching what right now. But are we really, right? Is this really what's going on or not? I, in my own example, can tell you if I want some chimney action, like, you know, something's running on the TV, I just stream something. I don't care what it is. 
I want some audio. I want some ambient noises. I can do my work. I can play with my kids. I can do something with my wife. Healthy relationship wise, obviously. But it's, it's something's going on on the TV and it, am I watching? Am I paying attention? Uh, I don't think so. It's background. It's, it's eliminating it, your experience, but it has nothing to do with what's on. Exactly. Whatever's on the screen at that time is clearly not resonating. Exactly. So uh, maybe I'm catching something on audio. Maybe I just play something I know. I like things I know, so I play something I know. I've seen the movie Matrix 50 times probably. I can talk with the guys who are in the movie. So when I feel like, come on, it's, it's the best sci-fi ever made. So if I... That's a whole other... It's a, it's a, it's a philosophical love story with a sci-fi twist. Yeah, I've seen it. Yes. Uh, so it means simply I need something in the background. Back then, I used to play my favorite TV channel, Cartoon Network, probably. Now it's just Netflix, Amazon Prime, Apple. So my attention is completely isolated from whatever is being streamed. And the question is, well, am I not entertained? Is, is this simply the new normal, us watching passively? Or maybe something's wrong with the content being streamed. So let's, this, let's set the scene for today's discussion. I'm creative. <laughs> I know IT. <laughs> so let's talk about estimating our uh, gaze, where we, what we look at. Uh, all of us who understand something about marketing research and uh, content consumption research know those devices. Uh, you can either mount a camera on a, a laptop here, this example here, or some uh, fixed point camera under a TV screen or the scene cameras um, uh, on your glasses. They are mounted to your head. They move with your head. They track your X, Y, and Z axis movement. And they are clunky. They are big. They are artificial. They create environment and perception of something being tested. There's something off here, right? Yes, maybe after 20, 30, 40 minutes, I get used to it. But eventually, well, it's still something that's mounted to my head. Like, Jay, how would you today want to see if the movie that you've made is being watched? Like, would you set this kind of landscape for, for a movie test? So whenever any movie we've ever done, any film, um, we always do a little test booth, usually with people that we know. It could be a small room like this, it could be a little conference room. And every time we do it, the filmmakers are watching the film. And I'm watching the audience. Because I've already seen the film more times than I care to usually, but I want to know what the audience is getting. Did they laugh when they're supposed to laugh or did they laugh when they're supposed to cry? And even when we do premieres in theaters, I'm sitting there like, oh, Jay, sit over here. And I was like, no, I want to stay in the back corner and I want to watch everybody. And really, and I think you spoke about this, a few of you guys have spoken about it, doing the testing when nobody knows they're being tested, that's everything. I mean, that's obviously where this is all going. And we're going to have to go through the clunkiness, you know, as we did when we see those old black and white TVs to get to this next level. But clearly, if we can, watch what people and, and just even here looking at all of you who's taking notes who's looking up this is where we really get the data and it's tricky because with the products it might be too late and you can only do okay this one didn't work but now what do i do for the next one so i think this is just a fabulous time that we're going through to kind of get to that better place which is which is fantastic exactly um so we've talked about gaze estimation and now let's take it into the wilderness. I want to remove all those devices. I want to remove fixed point camera setup. I want to make my environment as natural as possible so that we have something like, like Jeff said, that we don't know that we are being tested. If you're in a lab, if you're in a test room, if you have a device on your head, 
you feel tested. You also cheat because maybe you are paid for this test. So you want to do the best you can, right? You don't want to pretend that you're being tested. You just want to be tested. You, there's a great towards the end, right? You get paid for it and you're cheating. You don't know if this is really what you want to do. So uh, together with iSquare, we are starting initiative. We are successful, successful in it already of taking this into the wild. So forget the cameras, take the one that's embedded in your laptop or in your iPad or in your iPhone and use it for assessing of the user's attention. Yes, initially they have to sign all the consents, uh, tick all the boxes, say that they can approve their image being used for test purposes. But after a few minutes, they just forget about it and they do what they do. They go to the kitchen, make some coffee. They talk with their kids. They start cutting stuff for the meal. Yeah, they are there themselves. But there are some challenges with uh, this process. And we'll talk about them in a second. Um, we want to move this test phase into the comfort of our home. That's our aim. We want to be able to create an environment where an iSquare customer, an iSquare panelist comfortably sits on the couch, starts an application, starts a process, and is enjoying himself, herself is just doing what they want to do. And uh, this is then the real test that we're going to, to perform. We also know that lab is always a lab. It's an artificial place. There are people, your the attention is focused on yourself. Every move you make is carefully noted and you know this. You, you orchestrate your movement, your behavior, towards being perceived positively. We crave being perceived as good pupils, right? That's why we sit here in the front first bench so that everybody knows that DC are the, the smartest guys in the room, right? We always get the A grades. We, we want to create and to foster natural test environment. Now, I told you before uh, that tracking playtime is meaningless, right? because the, the function of TV has shifted from entertainment to a chimney sometimes. I know my wife, she knows every single Friends episode by heart because it's streamed on Comedy Central every single day and it, she plays it simply as her chosen entertainment. She plays with our kids together, she makes sure that homework is done and in the background we have friends, always. Does it make sense to position a commercial based on this information and embed it for a mother of four that is watching Friends? No, because she's not. What do you think about it, Jane? You have a lot of friends. I do. <laughs> um, there's no question about it. And I think this is really all about like we placing the ads or product placement into a movie, for example, which is definitely a revenue stream for producers it's harder and harder to make movie and theaters are coming back but it's still different but you know if i hold this like this in the scene that i'm in are you paying attention to this or are you pay attention to him because he's better looking so how do we engage and how do we get that to happen i think is critical and we can't find that out from how long they were on the show or the movie or whatever because it just doesn't give us the data that we need and being able to see Eyes are obviously very important, but movement as well. And to your point of in the surveys, it's the same thing with films. People used to go to you know Warner Brothers and old studios would pack people into a theater, comfortable seats, give them all the free soda and popcorn, and they filled out this little questionnaire. And half the people were asleep during the movie. They're like, "Yeah, I loved it, amazing. Oh yeah, that was the best scene ever," which they didn't see. So now you know the studio heads are like, "Great, let's do this." Whereas this is a bomb and they're about to lose a hundred million dollars. So there's no question we have to kind of take this to that better place and making people feel comfortable. They're gonna give us all the information. Yeah. And that's why we say that going into the wild, into your own home, house, room, bedroom is where we can track this meaningful attention. 
that really what really catches our attention am i am i entertained or not so where are we today with tracking meaningful attention it's a tough nut to crack because as opposed to the lab environment where we have fixed mounting points for your camera setup and a fixed uh, point where you're looking at the tablet is moving the, the planes the x y and z's are in constant movement i am lying on my back and the ipad is on my belly or it's next to me or it's in a stand or on a desk the camera that's supposed to catch our eyes is in constant movement so the point of reference is not fixed the the amount of mathematics you need to perform is huge but let me put this one number in, in, in into the room if you know trick and you know your tangents you can verify me but if you shift your eyes one degree your eyesight one degree that will translate into 1.7 centimeter slightly above 0.6 inches over a distance of one meter and a laptop or a mobile screen is smaller so if i do the calculations incorrectly i am maybe capturing incorrect information so to get from the theory yes that's very easy so it's just simply you track the eyes uh to to practice there is a huge amount of information you need to process huge amount of machine learning you need to process and this is where we together with uh, my amazing team at dac digital and with michael's amazing team at from I square are right now currently working on on solving so what we have already uh, quite a lot we are able to track eyes to uh, a field one field if you divide a, a phone a phone screen into nine fields three by three we can fix our attention and and calculate attention with high probability to one of those squares which is already a lot if you think about ads or product placement in a movie that already gives you some idea uh, am i paying attention to this shampoo or this lovely puppy walking with uh, with uh, with his lady or not which is great so we try to obviously abstract it create a set of libraries that can be used for a number of reasons but the common denominator is tracking the eyes and making sure that whatever i'm looking at I have the meaningful attention. So what could be next? Like, yes, it's a nice story to tell on marketing. People will, will be super happy. I can track the eyes. I can measure attention. I can see what drives the attention. But is it? Is this it? No, it's not. Think about new kind of interfaces for interacting with games or software. If I can make it more um, exact, more concrete, more detailed, I can have a game where instead of using my hands, I can use my eyes to guide the uh, the figure in the in, in the play in the game. I can uh, create content. I can use my eyes as interface between the digital and physical world. And right now we're working hard to perform this, but we already have, I can say this, I guess, uh, we have results better than NVIDIA has with their state-of-the-art technology. And together with iSquare, we want to take it to the next level. I hope that's not enough for you. If you have more questions, come back to me. Ask me all those difficult questions. Uh, yeah yes uh yeah so go ahead thank you thank you thank you Chris uh any questions for that I, I wanted to know if I missed, missed the part where where you two cooperate or how did you guys met like... uh that's a good story uh <laughs> So uh, our uh, BDM, our business develop, de development manager, Radek, knows Jay. Uh, they connected when uh, Przemek and Radek came to the States last time, a few days before I arrived. 
Uh, and we started building a project together, uh, us and Jay. It was a chemistry from day one, and we are working on a product. Well, you want to maybe say that, Jay? Um, we're developing a platform for the entertainment industry that will take projects from concept to distribution all on one platform, engaging creative fans and investors. So it's part global community, part ecosystem, part marketplace. So it's for anybody from a first time filmmaker to a studio, um, for those not in the entertainment world, every film or TV show is a brand new company. So everyone, whether you're Academy Award winner or first time filmmaker, start a brand new company and you have to start from scratch. And you have to evaluate whether it's a good, just like if it's any other business, you have to evaluate is the script worthy? Should it be done? What's the right budget for it? How do I put my team together? Where am I going to do all these things? And ultimately, I have to engage with my fans. And all these different pieces of the puzzle are totally disconnected. So working with these geniuses, <laughs> they can take this little little idea that I have um, and together basically change the world um, through storytelling, having a real impact and really being able to create, you know, this global community where we can create opportunities for people and um, people that never had opportunities before, whether they're in a small country or a big city like New York or L.A., we can connect all those people and through storytelling really have a global impact. So together with them and, and, and he said, right. And I've known Roddick, I actually met Roddick just before the pandemic or virtually. And we hit it off there originally and we stayed in touch. And then when this lovely gentleman came to town, we got together, we hit it off even further. Another interesting fact, Roddick is a giant. Anybody can hear that. So those of us who have been on Zoom for the past few years, we don't know anything except for the face of the people who are with. <laughs> and so we went with my lovely partner, Steph. We said, great, let's meet at this restaurant. And we said, great. And he actually was inside. We were outside. And I'm texting. I was like, we're here. He's like, we're here. I was like, great. We're in the outside table because I know the owner and we have a good spot. Great, I'll come to you. He comes up, Sam is sitting there like that. Like, <laughs> so interestingly before this is our first time meeting in person i was like okay before we go anywhere how tall are <laughs> so um anyway so yeah so that that's how we're working together and it's in, in conjunction and part of the way i am as a born and raised jewish new yorker i can't do anything or have somebody do something with me that i'm not doing back for them so we're working with them to help get more people to know who that digital is how great they are and the fact that we're working together because i'm not a sales guy I can talk to them. I can say, well, this is actually what they're like. This is what it means. When we have a meeting, this is how it works. When I say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. This is the feedback I get. This is the result I get. And it's just, it's it's really nice. And it's yeah. just, and my father was born in Poland. So there's a whole other level of connection. I love so long. Any more questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, so. We're related, aren't we? Like the hair and hair. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? So you're looking at the audience. And then let's say you feel a uh, reaction that's sort of opposite of what you expect. Now, at that point, are, are you able to? Uh, uh, you know, not the movie at all, or, or you, you can't, you absolutely can't. So, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, okay, I'm thinking it's done, and then by the time the next one comes, it's out, not done till yeah. it's released. Until it's released. Yeah, until it's really released, it's not done. And we had a very a tiny so movie edit. that we did. You yeah, we had a tiny movie that we did that premiered in Woodstock, and it was really cool, and everything like that. And we showed it to a fellow producer who's also a sales agent. So, the sales agent is one who ultimately gets it out to the distribution, and everything like that. And he sat through the movie. I let him sit by himself while I was watching him from the other room. Um, he watched the whole movie. He's like, it's really great. I love it, this and that. It's like, there's something missing here. I don't know what it is, but there's something missing in this spot. So we went back. I brought the writers in, the director. I said, like, okay, what do we do? We came up with a new scene. We figured out how do we connect this all together. We went back and shot it. Now, this movie was shot in the middle of the winter in way upstate New York, the snow was literally up to here. And now after it being edited, it's spring. It's like, great, how do we do this? But we did. So somehow we came up with a flashback scene and all this sort of stuff. And we went back, we did another couple of days of shooting and we did it. So 
it is possible if you're open-minded to it, if you're willing to right, listen right. to it. And I think that if you get objective data, then I think you, you're, you know, you're foolish not to listen to it, but at least you're open, you should be open-minded to listen to it. So it, it is definitely possible. Well, some big movies like Basic Instinct, uh, the ending was changed based on initial audience. Yeah, yeah, and it happens. The smart ones do that. The smart ones do that. Some of them most go, you know, there's, there's plenty of movies that don't do that. Wasn't live sports going to move to a, you can get any version of it, any version of the commentary you want. That would be lovely. Coming from lovely. a sports background, now. No, that was all from the, you know, if you're from New York, you might get the Yankees commentator. If you're from um, Boston, you might get the Boston Red Sox commentator. That would be nice. That would be nice. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, coming on my background is I was a semi-pro tennis player. And I was in the tennis world for a long time, and I would go to all these matches, and there would be the greatest matches would be on court 32. <laughs> But the cameras were on. Yeah, it looked like it was. And so I think that's a very interesting point. And, and actually, when you think about that from commentary, the tone is different. Like, depending on the commentator on what sport you're watching, you have a totally different feeling about that that game or match that you watch. So it's yeah, very it's just think about George and I and how easy it is right now. So it, that changed everything. So you can. Switch scenes, uh, you can switch the voice yeah. So right now it's there's there's that's definitely amazing. taught well, this is where we're getting into this like murky area with creatives, of yeah. course, that you know the writers don't want to be in this position where the AI is writing the script and all this sort of stuff is happening. It's it's I, I it's interesting you say that we have a thing that we say in, in, within our company is that we use technology to make life easier and human interaction to make it better. And I believe that is the future. I'm certainly going to do my part to make that the future because I think it's great, all the technology that we have, but I kind of like this and it's cool and it's fun and I pick up energy from everybody and I think we have to find that balance. But I think there, there's a lot of talk about that. I mean, there have been, a, what was Clue, I think, did that, that they showed there's, there are four different endings. And depending on what you did in the movie, it would show you one ending or the other end. So... I think that's kind of cool. Like, I think let's let's push the limits. Let's do interesting things like that. I mean, it's gonna be fun. You go to a lot of the old school creative agencies. They just don't want to have anything to do with the data. They don't want to hear it. Um, yeah, it's true. It's really but, true. But I just like a comment about the quality data. Um, you know, we have a similar issue. Um, you know, getting getting visual computer vision data is is tough because it freaks people out. Yes. Um, it can. That doesn't freak them out. But it can. Actually, in Europe, it does. The GDPR, you know, the data privacy regulations. But if, but if you can build, if you can build consumer services for this actual inherent value, that's an important thing to, to crack and keep experimenting a little bit with it. But that's a, a big thing because research channels, by definition, are you know weird people. Um, or natural to some extent. Um, so the more you can embed technologies like yours and ours, where it provides an inherent consumer value, mm -hmm. the, the better the data. And that's something that's not cracked yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, as humans, we're willing to give up a lot for a better life in some way or another. I mean, we've given up certain things that our grandparents would say, we're never giving that up, but we do, but then we get a benefit from it. So I think if it's not really invasive and we can see it like it's not, oh, Big Brother's coming in to take over all, that's, we don't want that in general. But I think if we can show there's value from, for your life, for the betterment of society, I think people are open to that. I like to always know. Any other questions or comments? Thanks for saying, by the way. Yes, thank you. Well, Thank you guys for everything. Thanks so much. It was very interesting uh, to see the audience engagement. <laughs> Thank you. I like seeing where we were, to where we are now, to where we're going with the eye tracking, using eye tracking awesome. for video games. So very interesting to see where we're going. Uh, again, thank you all for staying, for being with us here today. To conclude, I'd like to welcome our wrestler back on stage <laughs> with a, a speech on gratitude. Michael asked me to share something. Uh, yeah, because that's cool. Well, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, you can go down. Yeah, you can.